From Number 5 Chambers, I'm Richard Kimblin, and this is The Planning Podcast. This week, virtual hearings. Oliver Lawrence, Planning and Environmental Barrister at Number 5 Chambers, joins me to talk through some of the experience to date, and we look at the upsides and the downsides, and how you might want to influence the way in which your case is heard. Oliver, hello, how are you? Very well, thank you, Richard. Good to hear from you. Now, between us, we've had some experience in contested hearings, in making submissions uh, in the planning court and that uh, examination in public. And we have so far managed to elucidate some of the differences between what it is that you can achieve before the tribunal, before the judge, in a physical environment and doing that virtually. And we've tried to work out how best to deal with some of those differences. Of course, what we are engaged with is exactly the same as before we were thrust into the virtual world. We're seeking to persuade, to clarify, to challenge, to reach accommodation and resolutions. And the structure of those events is still the same. The roles are still the same. And What's changed is the way in which those roles are performed, the way in which they're modified. And we can have a look together at the way in which effective oral communication can still be brought about virtually and the ways in which it's limited. Now, one of the ways in which there's definitely a change is, I would say, atmosphere. But has that been your experience, Oliver? It has, Richard. I would say that your concerns are certainly warranted in part. There is a certain atmosphere felt in the room that you don't get at home when you're sitting behind a screen. When we speak in court or in the inquiry room, we pick up on many small non-verbal cues from the judge, the barrister or the witness. These cues affect what we say and more importantly, they affect how we say it. It's much harder to pick up on them in a virtual hearing, with the result that it all feels much less natural. The result that it feels much less natural. Yes, that's a fascinating observation, and it is exactly the point which came out just this morning while taking part in the South Oxfordshire local plan examination, where a lady who was making representations to the inspector paused, looked at the inspector through her screen and said, you look bored, which was something that brought everybody to their attention. And what was happening is that the inspector was looking off to his left, apparently into the distance, apparently gazing out of the window, but he was doing nothing of the sort. Uh, The inspector explained that he was looking at a document on screen. So the visual cue, the direction in which the person is looking, was in fact a miscue. The inspector was very interested. He was taking the trouble to look at the document and to read material which related to what was being said to him, a visual miscue. That's the sort of thing that we're going to have to start to deal with, isn't it? Right. And it's more difficult to persuade the inspector if you don't know where his or her attention lies. Cross-exam- I know we're going to come on to cross-examination, but cross-examination is also more challenging. Yeah, well, let's let's go straight into that now. What's your experience, Oliver? My experience is, Richard, it's very difficult to deliver a good cross without closely tracking the interest of the judge or the inspector. It's how you know when to drop a line of questioning or when to press a witness for just a bit more. And these can be subtle reads. Obviously, it's much easier to read the inspector's facial expressions and their body language. If you're in the room with them, you can see what they're looking at. It's all valuable information. Interestingly, I've found that my my closing submissions are relatively unaffected by uh, this virtual disconnect. And I think that's because they're much less likely to be interrupted. And so keeping track of these nonverbal cues just isn't as important. Now, I gather that you cross-examined by video for three hours or so. What was the approach of the judge? Was it what you would have expected pre-virtual hearings 
or was the judge's approach somewhat different and by reason of the technology? Well, some judges are more interventionist than others, so it's always difficult to know um, how he acted relative to his norm. But I would say the technology made him impatient. The audio issues, the technical issues tended to slow down the pace, as the witness often said that they couldn't hear the question or couldn't understand it. And so this judge was clearly keen to get involved and steer the cross-examination to what they found to be most interesting. Well, that's very interesting because one observes in respect of the South Oxfordshire examination that the inspector starts each day by observing the difficulties which are inherent in that procedure and invites all participants to be patient with each other. So plainly, it's a matter which tribunals have to direct themselves to address. And likewise, the parties need to have that in mind in their planning, don't they? Uh, they absolutely do. And I think as virtual hearings take off, there'll be more pressure on the parties to come to agreement on important matters um, so as to spare tribunal or the inquiry this long form way of giving evidence. So you're emphasising the need for concision, getting to the point. Do, do you think this is going to make these hearings longer, shorter? What's the balance going to be? I think that these hearings will eventually become shorter as parties come to agreement on, on more and more issues. It's much harder for experts to explain complex points via the virtual link. And so parties may well decide that it, it's in neither of their interests uh, to drag out a hearing by contesting difficult specialisms this way. Uh, nonetheless, it is a level playing field, and so whatever deficiencies might arise in the course of giving evidence, uh, that affects them both equally. And uh, one other fact about uh, virtual hearings is that they will reduce costs across the board, won't they? Well, that's certainly a factor, isn't it? Certainly in terms of travel time, uh, accommodation. What strikes me, therefore, listening to what you've just said, is that there may well be scope here for an increased use of mixing events. And we, of course, see that uh, in the Business and Planning Act had just uh, given royal assent yesterday, mixing of styles. But what also could emerge is the use of a hybrid approach where key witnesses and perhaps some participants are present in a physical venue, rather like the six-day event which uh, I dealt with a couple of weeks ago uh, with the very considerable assistance of Nina Pindam. That had expert witnesses who were key to the case present in the hearing. Others, the factual witnesses, albeit professional, present by video, and solicitors present by video. And so mixing video and physical presence was the solution there. Do you think we'll be seeing that in inquiries or hearings? Yes, I think we will, Richard. Um, I think that both the inspectorate and the parties um, will come under some pressure to distinguish between and different areas of expertise and which are more suitable for giving evidence in person, which are more suitable for giving evidence remotely. Right. So when we come to case management stage, what, what do you think parties should be considering when they need to think ahead to how the case is going to be presented? Well, I think that it's in their mutual interest to consider how much they can agree. Just thinking about what's in the interests of each party pitted against the other, one important thing that, that they'll need to think about is exactly how their evidence is going to come across virtually. Um, it sounds obvious, but once you've seen a virtual hearing, once you've participated in one, you can see the very limited way in which a witness is giving evidence. Uh, there's only so much they can say, and uh, there's only so much they can expand on, um, especially if the subject matter is complicated. And so a party might well think, well, I've got a witness um, whose answer to that potential question is rather nuanced and rather complicated. I'd rather they didn't have to give evidence in the virtual format. Um, let's see. Let's see what I can agree. Right. So the impact is is much wider than just understanding how to use your microphone 
and your laptop camera, the impact you're suggesting goes to the extent of the contested issues in the case. That's absolutely right. That's what I've found. It's stemming from the technological issues which are inevitably in play in virtual hearings. But there was a shared understanding that there was only so much that you could ask a witness or that the witness could answer given these technological constraints. Because often the witness would not be able to hear your question or understand it. But certainly given the indications from the judge, um, he felt that uh, there was only so much that he could gain from listening to a witness via a virtual link. Now, my experience of video link evidence was mixed uh, in that I took the view that it was actually relatively successful for relatively simple evidence. The difficulty arises where there is heavy documentation for the parties to examine via the witness. That really does slow things down. It seemed to me that time estimates need to be increased by a third to take account of the lag. And that's really another topic, getting to the electronic documentation in a way which is easily used by people at different ends of the country using multiple screens. And that's what's slow. And that's what is in fact gained by having everybody together in the same room uh, as and when that becomes safe to do so. And it's going to be really fascinating to see the extent to which those two points which are intention, the cost saving of having people just in their local environment and being present virtually, as against the cost saving of getting through things more efficiently by everybody being together. That's, that's a story which seems to me is yet to really play out. I certainly found it incredibly helpful to have a separate screen just for documentation so that I could keep my eye um, on the judge at all times. Certainly, with regards to time limits, uh, I think third increases sounds accurate because that's exactly how much I exceeded my allocated cross-examination time, much to the impatience of this judge. Oh, I see. So your time estimate was two hours and it uh, ended up as three. Absolutely. Three hours was not the designated, <laughs> designated time limit. Well, no, no, no doubt the, the witness had a role in that too. <laughs> they did. And you've just mentioned how a lot of time will be spent looking for documents and making sure that everyone's looking at the same thing. I could tell you the electronic paper shuffle was quite an effective technique deployed by my witness, who I was cross-examining. Oh, sorry, let me just get this up. I'm looking for this document. You're referring there to the paper shuffle and the way in which witnesses have available to them a means of slowing you down. Oliver, what do you think uh, the barrister's answer to that is? Well, Richard, I think that it just makes it more and more important for the barrister's questions to be as sharp and as focused as possible, because there will be this inevitable lag time as witnesses scavenge for the right electronic documents and the inspector makes sure that everyone is looking at the same document. Well, there we go. We identify an upside that by reason of the constraints which the technology imposes, it brings about a need for a greater discipline by the advocates and increased focus. So there is, in fact, an upside to the downside. It, that, that's effectively what you're saying, isn't it? An incentive to be more efficient in giving evidence and in interrogating evidence um, in virtual hearings. Well, Oliver, it's been fantastic to hear what the learning is on that. And you're plainly ahead and leading in respect of this new style of advocacy. And it's been really fascinating to hear what you think the impacts are in a, in a variety of ways uh, and the way in which it's going to play out. So I'm sure that everybody will be very grateful to you for sharing uh, in that frank way uh, what your experience has been. So thank you very much indeed. Stay safe. Thank you for having me, Richard. That was the planning podcast from Number 5 Chambers. Coming up on the planning podcast will be a return to net zero 
in the particular context of residential development and the challenges faced by residential developers. Till then, stay safe.